Okay, first I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so this uh, talk is about addressing a controversy between SACS and PET experiments in studying this protein collapse, okay? So if you take a protein, these are generally heteropolymers synthesized from amino acids, okay? So at physiological conditions, generally they are in the folded state. So this is an example of a protein in the folded state. So it needs to be folded to generally perform its function. But at high temperatures or high denaturant concentrations, what happens is these folded states unfold and they behave like random coils. So, so, so in the random coils, uh, so now uh, experimentalists generally use temperature and denaturants both to unfold these proteins. So now what you can do is you take a random coil, so uh, and the other important factors, they use urea and guanidinium, so I want to mention this too, uh, as denaturants. So now you take a protein in a random coil in a high denaturant concentration, and what you do is you dilute it to close to zero molar. Then now the protein is in an environment which is conducive for it to go to the folded state. So now the question is what happens to the protein dimensions in the first 100 microseconds? This is called the burst phase of folding. So that is studied by, uh, so here you have a protein in a high denaturant concentration. It exhibits this Flory exponent. To be exact, it's 0.588. But so now it's in a random coil, so in a high denaturant solution, now you are diluting the denaturant close to zero molar. So now the question is, within this first 100 microseconds, which is called the burst phase of folding, do you see a compaction in the protein dimension? So, so either you see that, and from the compacted state, some folded structure nucleates, which finally goes into the folded state, or you don't see this state, so you wait for some time for the nucleation event to occur, which finally leads to the folded state. So there are two experimental techniques which generally study uh, this burst phase of folding. One is a single molecule FRET, fluorescence resonance energy transfer, and the other is SAC, small angle X-ray scattering. So in FRET, what you do is you attach a donor and an acceptor at the two ends of the protein, and you measure basically the energy efficiency of transfer between the donor and actor. So if these are like random coils, the transfer of efficiency, uh, the transfer of uh, the energy transfer efficiency is low. But if it's compacted, the efficiency goes up. So from this changes in efficiency, they infer the protein dimension. In SACS, using the standard Guignard analysis, you can basically get the radius of gyration. So the radius of gyration is nothing but if the protein has n monomers, so it's, uh, and Ri is the position of each monomer, and Rcm is the center of mass of the protein concentration. Okay? So, so this talk is primarily motivated by this paper from University of Chicago. What they say is basically the FRET experiments on dozen odd proteins says that there is compaction during the burst phase of folding. But if you look at the SACS experiments, they say that they don't see uh, compaction in the, during the burst phase of folding at all. So finally, they argue that the SACS and FRET, the differences, disagreement between SACS and FRET is statistically significant. And this concept of protein collapse during the burst phase is still up in there. So, so I want to address basically where this discrepancy is coming from between the SACS and the FRET experiment. So the discrepancy is pretty ugly basically for this protein called protein L where you have clean data from both SACS and FRET. So this is a very simple protein. It's a model protein which the experimentalists routinely use to study various aspects of folding. So it has 64 residues and in the folded form it has four beta strands uh, labeled beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4 and one helix. So the other way of visualizing this folded structure is using a contact map. So in the contact map, basically, so each amino acid in this protein has basically two groups. One group forms the backbone, and the other group forms the side chain. So if you coarse grain it, you, so if you coarse grain the amino acid uh, so that the backbone atoms form a single effective bead and the side chain atoms forms another effective bead, basically you have two beads in that coarse grain amino acid. So you have 64 residues here. So if you coarse grain it, you'll have 128. So what I'm pl pl plotting is uh, the bead numbers on x-axis and y-axis. And if the two beads in the folded structure are less than a cutoff distance, say eight angstroms, uh, you put, you get a data point here. So basically, if you look at the strands beta one and beta two in the folded state, they are very close. They are in contact. So that's that's where the contacts appear. So the contacts along the diagonal are between residues which are close by along the contour of the chain. And if you have any long range contacts, they appear as off diagonal elements. For example, in this protein, there's loop closure in the folded form. So that's where 
you see those contacts. Okay, so these are called the native contacts, and these play a role, important role in modeling this protein. So this is the data. I'm showing you the data from SACS and SMFRED. So what you're seeing is the radius of gyration as a function of gonadinium hydrofluoride. This is the denaturant which is used to denature the protein. So at high denaturant concentrations, the RG is high. That means the protein is in the unfolded state. So now what I'm doing is they are diluting the gonadinium hydrofluoride. So there are two sets of FRET experiments. One is from the gillard Haran group at Wiseman, and this is from Eaton's group at National Institutes of Health in US. So this first experiment shows that there's a 12 angstrom compaction in the protein dimensions during the burst phase as you dilute the denaturant. Whereas the other set of experiments shows that there's only six angstroms. So, the, so although these experiments are done on the same protein with the same dyes, uh, the discrepancy, the reason for the discrepancy between the experiments is not clear yet. So basically, uh, FRED experiments conclude that there is some compaction in the protein dimensions as you dilute the denaturant. But this is SACS data, which is shown in solid squares. So there's essentially, they say that there is no compaction in the protein dimensions at all. So I'm trying to address, understand the source for this discrepancy between these two experimental techniques. So basically, so these protein folding problem has resisted, like it's not possible to solve it analytically. So the only cause of, uh, the only way you can study is using uh, some kind of simulation. But even these proteins, they fold on a millisecond time scale. So only if you want to model this at an atomistic resolution, there are only two, three groups in the world which have the hardware to simulate that long. So most of us have to resort to some kind of coarse graining. So to study this problem, I use a coarse grain model. So this is a contour of the chain. This is residue I, and this is residue I plus one. So the way I coarse grain is there's a group of atoms which form the backbone. They, I put an effective bead there to represent those atoms. The other group forms a side chain. So there's another bead which represents the side chain. So and the energy function for this coarse grain model is pretty simple. Uh, so there's bonded. B stands for bonded and B stands for non-bonded. So this bonded potential, so whenever two beads are, have a bond, they are represent, so that bond is represented by this nonlinear potential called the Feeney potential. And for the non-bonded potential, there are two kinds. One is called the native and the non-native. So the native interactions are present in beads which appear in the contact map, which you have seen here. So all these pairs of beads have interact with the Leonard Jones kind of potential. So they have some kinds of interactions. The rest of the pairs are purely repulsed. Okay, so this is a pretty simple model. If you want any details, I can tell you later. So I take this model and I run a simple Langevin dynamic simulation. So what I see here is at the melting temperature, I'm plotting the fraction of native contact. So at the melting temperature, both the folded state and unfolded state are equally stable. So you can see that the protein hops between the two states as a function of time. So the protein exhibits simple two-state folding kinetics. But the problem with this, he, with this is in simulations, generally use temperature to fold and unfold the protein. But in experiments, they use this denaturant called guanidinium and urea. So now how do you map these results? How do you map the simulation results onto the experiments? So to overcome that, we developed a model. Basically, let me skip in the interest of time. But what happens is this is a coarse grain model in the absence of one in the absence of denation. So this is the concentration of the denation, which is zero. And R is the uh, coordinates for, the pro for a protein conformation. So if I add, so in the partition function, I'll have the protein coordinates, water coordinates, and the denation coordinates. So when I'm coarse graining, what I'm doing, I'm basically integrating out the solvent coordinates and the denation coordinates. So if I do that, this term appears, which is the free energy of transferring a protein conformation from water to a denation solution. So using some experimental data, we found that you can compute this term. So basically what you are doing is you run a Langevin dynamic simulations in the absence of denaturants, various temperatures, and you get a bunch of protein conformations using this energy function. So for each conformation, you can compute the free energy of transferring that protein conformation from water to denaturant. Now you can use this as a perturbation to this, and you can compute if this is your any property in the absence of denaturant, Using perturbation theory, you can compute that property in the presence of a denaturant at any temperature. Okay, so this is a basic simple idea. So once you do that, so now I'm comparing the data. So this is the FRED data. 
So this is the fraction of the protein in the folded state as a function of denaturant concentration. So at low denaturants, the protein is fully folded. And in the high denaturant states, the protein is unfolded. So this is data from three experiments. And the red triangles are the simulation data. So there's a very good quantitative agreement between simulations and experiments. And this is the SACS data where they measure RG as a function of the guanidinium hydrochloride. Again, you see a very good agreement between both simulations and it. So this sort of validates the model to understand the source of discrepancy between the SACS and FRED. So now we go back and look at the FRED data. So this is the FRED efficiency for the efficiency of transfer, energy transfer between the donor and the acceptor dyes, so which are attached to the two ends of the protein. Okay, so that is computed using an equation called the Froster uh, equation equation. So this PRRE is the end-to-end -end distribution because the dyes are attached to the two ends of the protein. So I need this end-to-end -end distribution. Uh, RE is the, again the end-to-end -end distance and R0 is a froster radius which is a property of the two dyes and L is the contour length of the protein. So, so using this equation we compute the FRET efficiency. So these red dots are the simulation data and the green squares is one set of experiments and this cyan diamonds are the second set. So we agree very well with one of the experiments. And the error bars are pretty high because we, this tells you that the protein in the unfolded state is really sampling wide conformations. Okay, so there's a huge range in the conformations it's sampling. So now what we do is, so this is what the experimentalist measures. So from the FRET efficiency, he's trying to infer or get back the size of the protein. So the way he does is, so it's a pretty difficult life for an experimentalist because he knows the FRET efficiency and he needs a distribution. So it's an inverse problem for, for the experimentalist. So what they assume is they assume that the polymer, that the protein follows a Gaussian chain statistic. Okay, so they use a Gaussian chain end-to-end -end distance and from that you can infer RG from the end-to-end -end distance square. So we exactly followed the, what the experimentalist did. And this is, I'm plotting RG as a function of guanidinium hydrochloride. So this is the radius of gyration in the blue diamonds, which we get if you follow the experimentalist protocol. And this is the green squares is the experimental data. So it's a very good quantitative agreement between both. But the advantage I have is using, since I've run a simulation, I know the protein conformations explicitly. So I go back and compute the radius of gyration directly. So that is the red square. So what's happening here is the FRET, due to the assumption of the Gaussian chain statistics, is overestimating the compaction of the protein. And the other interesting thing is, as you increase the gonadinium concentration, the divergence between uh, the real data and the FRET estimated data is increasing. So to understand why this is happening, of course, the discrepancy is coming from this distribution. So we plot the actual true distribution for the end-to-end -end distance. Uh, from the Gaussian chain, this is the fit, and this is the actual true distribution. So at low concentrations, the averages are fine, but the widths are, uh, with the width, there's a discrepancy in the width. So since I'm interested in this, I not only need the average, right, but also the width of the distribution. Since the averages are okay here, so the discrepancy is small at low concentrations, but if I go to high concentrations, both the there's a mismatch in both the averages as well as the variance. So that's why the deviation between the FRET estimated RG and the real RG is increasing as a function of gonadinium. So basically the idea is the FRET is overestimating yeah. RG because of so, yeah. so, so the FRET is overestimating RG because of the Gaussian chain approximation. So if you look at the SACS data, so this is actual SACS experiments. So if you look at this uh, data, so what they found is this part of the data you can fit either with a line of slope zero or a line with slope 0.33 angstrom per mole. So if you, this is a simulation data, so we, if you, we can fit the data here with a slope of 0.36. So the way the SACS experiments infer there's no collapses, there's three data points here. These are the experimental data points in black triangles, one, two, three. So they compared the data at four, four molar concentration and they compared this with one molar and 0.5 molar approximately. They said there's no statistical, I mean, there's no difference in between the data points here. So they said there's no compaction. But if you compare again with our data, which is at four here, and if you compare this, there's only one angstrom difference, so which is really within the statistical uncertainty. So you see some compaction, but the compaction is so tiny that is that is it is within the statistical uncertainties of the Sachs experiment. Okay, so let me just conclude. So this.
fret, the, so the disagreement between fret and SACS is because the fret uses this Gaussian chain polymerization to infer the size of the protein uh, from the efficiency. It turns out to be a bad approximation uh, because these are not really Gaussian chains. And uh, since the experimentalists have used a very small protein, the compaction is really small and that is within the statistical uncertainty of this argument. So, thank you. Any questions? So, if you try to estimate distances which are large using FRET, then there is a problem because the transfer rate is one upon R to the power six or something. Yeah. But uh, why should it matter what is the polynomial, what is the Gauss assumption or not, you know, because it's just an experimental measurement. It doesn't depend on uh, the model which goes into your, um, how would you infer the distance just given the data without making the Gaussian polymer assumption? Okay. So you can use some assumption, but it turns out since the ch changes, first of all, the protein is not a Gaussian change. It's a self-avoiding chain and there's inherent structure in it. So that itself tells you why. I don't see any reason why the Gaussian chain distribution should be right there. If you want to infer at least to get an idea of the distances, maybe you can use a Gaussian chain. But if you want accurate distances and if you want to compare it numerically with other techniques, then you need an accurate distribution, not a Gaussian chain distribution. In fact, you can use other distributions. You can use a warm light chain model distribution or a self-avoiding. Even they don't give you results that are very accurate. The problem is they have used a very small size protein where the compaction is really small and now they are fighting over those three angstroms and four angstroms. That is a real problem. If they use a bigger protein, maybe 200 residues or 300 residues. The compaction would be big and probably both will see some kinds of compaction. The problem is with the try fighting over, not over quali quant qualitative picture, they are fighting over quantitative numbers. So that is where the problem is. So at the end, it's fight over nothing, basically. So let 